Welcome to the Senior Rehab Podcast. The podcast for rehab clinicians that want to better serve older adults. And now, your host, Dustin Jones. Thank you, friends, for taking the time to listen to the Senior Rehab Podcast today. I appreciate your download. Today on the show, we have Dr. Kathy Cholik from the University of Delaware. She is the co-director of clinical education there at Delaware and runs a, a clinic, uh, kind of an outpatient uh, clinic focused on older adults. Uh, she's also started a geriatric residency. She has owned her own home health contracting company, has worked in several areas, and is just a wealth of wisdom and information and good advice for simple people like me. <laughs> so I really appreciate talking with her. You'll really enjoy uh, our conversation. Um, I really appreciated her uh, advice for kind of new grads, people coming out of school, um, and also how she's really kind of pushing the brink in how we teach uh, working with older adults in DPT school. So you'll enjoy it. Let's get into this with Dr. Kathy Cholik from the University of Delaware. Kathy Cholik, welcome to the Senior Rehab Podcast. Thank you for your time this morning. Great. It's nice to be here. Thanks, Dustin. Yes. So I'm excited to talk with you. Uh, you are quite the experienced clinician and in education and academia now. So I really value you know that perspective, especially when someone uh, is interested in older adults. But before we kind of dive into what you're doing now, I have to ask, how did you get into physical therapy? It's so funny because I um, I'm about the least spontaneous person you'll ever meet. <laughs> and uh, I was in high school, actually. And one of the announcements that came over, the morning announcements, was they were looking for people to help at a camp for children with disabilities. Hmm. And so um, and I went and I signed up, not having any idea. I wasn't driving yet. I didn't have a way to get there. But um, so I ended up volunteering for a month. Uh, the summer after my freshman year of high school wow. at a camp for children. So I actually went to PT school thinking I was going to go into pediatrics. Huh. And um, along the way, really fell in love with geriatrics and have been uh, uh, fell in love with physical therapy while I was working with these kids and felt it was a really great match for me. But yeah. then ended up falling into geriatrics and have worked in uh, with older adults almost my entire career. Wow. Where was that camp? Um, it was a it was a call, camp called Camp Manito. It was run by the uh, United Cerebral Palsy okay. organization, um, and it was at AI Dupont Hospital here in uh, Wilmington. Okay, so you said you you kind of fell in love with geriatrics, you know, after first uh, working with those those kids. Mm -hmm. um, was yeah, tell me about that process in terms of the change of your interests. Well. Partially, it, it, it's a funny story because my internship that was supposed to be in pediatrics got canceled. <laughs> um, I tell my students now because I'm a clinical educator mm -hmm. and, and one of these CEs here that, uh, you know, you never know why things happen. And yeah. so I didn't get my pediatrics internship. Instead, I was uh, in a, um, an orthopedic-based employee health department. And I bet uh, you were angry about that, weren't you? I was really not so happy <laughs> about that. Uh, it turned out for the best. I ended up... Um, Meeting my husband on the internship, so Man. it was a it was a good thing. That's but in in the end, uh, so I never did get to do pediatrics, and I went into at the time back in the late eighties when I graduated. Everybody was encouraged to go to work in a hospital and mm -hmm. and do like experiences in all the different areas. So I went to our our local hospital and and did rehab and outpatient and home health and uh, rehab and orthopedics all like on the total joint floor. So. That's really kind of where I fell in love with. This is this is my area, older adults. Yeah. Do do you give that advice in terms of you know that first job out? You know, it's it's pretty good to work in the hospital. Do you still go by that? You know, uh, I encourage people to to be somewhere that they um, can get exposed to different. That's what they want. Yeah. I mean, students now partially you know coming into a graduate program versus an undergrad at the time where I was. I, they have a little bit more life experience, some of them, and, and kind of know what direction they want to go. Mm -hmm. But, you know, we do require a couple different types of internships here for our students. So yeah. my goal is just be open-minded while you're on them, mm. um, you know, and see where where you fall in love with. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good point. So, you know, you left, you left school. Uh, what was your first job out of school? 
So my first job was in an acute care hospital mm. uh, where, you know, we did rotations and um, one of them was sports medicine. In the evenings, we did home health, outpatient, uh, neuro, rehab, and general acute care floor okay. uh, stuff. And then from there, I actually, uh, my husband and I um, started our own home health business uh, doing contract therapy. And, and that was, again, mostly entirely geriatrics at that point. Wow. And how, how long were you in that, that first job? At, at St. Francis? Uh, I was there um, two and a half years, okay. I think. Wow. So when you transition into home health, because I'm, I'm interested in this contract uh, home health work. I'm, I'm an employee of, of a company. Mm-hmm. Um, what were the biggest lessons learned when you started uh, Cholik Physical Therapy? <laughs> That's actually what it was called, yeah. <laughs> um, we, you know, it was uh, a how, you know, how to run a business. We certainly had all of the uh, financial pieces and tax pieces of being self-employed mm-hmm. um, back in the time. So this was in the early nineties. If you go back the, um, our insurance options for, we, we owned it as a sole proprietorship. And so uh, finding health insurance at the time was mm-hmm. really complicated. And, and that was probably our biggest lesson learned. We, um, that was when I eventually uh, had twins. Yeah. And uh, so we, we were not as well insured as we should have been. And so that was partially why we ended up giving up the business and, and going to full-time employment for both of us. Really? So let's say if you're in the same position at this day and age where, you know, it's, it's easier to get health insurance, probably a little more expensive <laughs> per, <laughs> per month. Um, not, I'm not really sure if it's more expensive per really? month than it okay. was then. Wow. Um, yeah, that it, yeah, it wasn't okay. a good but, <laughs> um, So let's say you're in that position today. Um, what do you think you would, what do you do? You know, the, the, the freedom of being able to create your own schedule and to be able to um, not be bound to any time constraints. I spent as much time with people as I needed. It, mm-hmm. it, uh, we could pick some geography, although we covered a, each of us covered a fairly large geography, but it was nice having a partner and my husband in that we were able to shift patients between us sometimes if, mm-hmm. you know, if geography expanded in his area and I need to go down there a little bit. So that, that backup piece was certainly nice. Yeah. Um, home health is a, it's such a wonderful thing to treat people in their own homes and, and get to see how they function in real daily activities. Mm-hmm. Uh, that was my favorite thing. Um, yeah. And now I think with internet being available and we didn't really have that at the time um, so much, just having a network is important. I think that was probably the other real lesson learned at the time. We had each other to bounce ideas off clinically and those kinds of things. But uh, I think the being able to access technology and have a resource group for yourself yeah. so that you're, you're making sure you're really challenging patients and learning every day. Mm. Yeah, that's a game changer for sure. Uh, even in, I mean, I've only been doing home health for two and a half, three years, but even in that that time frame, the latter half of that two and a half to three years, I've started to interact uh, professionally online. And that's just been huge because before that, I was definitely kind of out there on an island doing my own thing and yeah. uh, not challenged whatsoever. Um, I'm going to I'm going to take a step back. Sorry, I, I'm very intrigued by this first job that you had at St. Francis Hospital. So, you know, that that first job. How were you different coming out of that job and going into it in terms of uh, just your clinical reasoning or your perceptions of geriatrics? Yeah. So, you know, the thing I really learned about geriatrics uh, that I don't know that I got as much in school or as, mm-hmm. as I should have, or, and some of it was um, you know, not necessarily being open to the opportunity because I thought I was going a different direction perhaps. Mm-hmm. So, just really being able to see how to work with an older adult. Um, our, our evidence-based medicine back in the day, so this was in the early 90s, mm. um, wasn't really as extensive certainly as it is today. And so, um, you know, we at that time still occasionally got referrals for the, you know, the hot pack ultrasound massage. Yeah. And so trying to do education at that point um, to move, you know, from the outpatient world and, mm-hmm to move into caring for the older adults that we saw more particularly in inpatient and rehab and home health 
that just how important it is to keep someone moving mm. um, and, and to address what's important to them. I think that was probably the biggest lesson I learned mm-hmm. was to um, set aside any preconceived notions I had about what's important to people mm. <laughs> and uh, really focus on what's their goals because, you know, things that I wouldn't necessarily have come up with on my own, they, they could teach me a lot about. Yeah. That seems to be a theme on this podcast when I ask people about <laughs> about the lessons learned. And I can echo that as well. So, so now you're you're at the University of Delaware. Uh, tell us about the transition into academia. Yeah, so I came um, on board to the university because they were at the time. Um, hoping to open a, a clinic for older adults. Hmm. And so I had a lot of contacts here from my activities with the Physical Therapy Association and had been a you know a leader in the chapter. And so I knew a lot of um, several of the faculty who were involved with our group. Hmm. And they said, Kathy, there's this opportunity for you that just sounds great. And so I uh, came and talked about it and we have here, you know, a really great established outpatient sports clinic yeah. that had been going on for decades. And they changed the DBT at that point and really wanted to make sure they were creating a well-rounded clinician. Yeah. So they wanted to open a clinic specifically for older adults or people with neurologic impairments. Hmm. And so I came on board um, to help get that started. So I actually came in as a clinician um, into the academic world. And so I, it was a really kind of fun because I could take everything I had known about you know, 15-ish years, I guess, of experience at that point yeah. as a clinician and say, okay, this is how I think we should create a cl- outpatient clinic for older adults and wow. and then use it to train our students because that's really the whole point is uh, why we have clinics here is, is to be able to provide students um, an opportunity to do what we consider best practice um, mm. in the clinics. Wow. So that must have been pretty pretty amazing. I bet you know, you just did all kinds of, you know, hot packs and ultrasound and new step <laughs> and underdosed seated therax with, you know, with Theraband, no. right? <laughs> I, I do think we have a hot pack machine somewhere, <laughs> but, um, you know, the, it, it was really kind of, well, designing it from a sp- Face utilization, you know, mm. how how do I want the clinic to look different? Yeah. Um, you know, things like how do we deal with the sound? How can I, if I have people with cognitive impairment, is there a quiet place? But our, our clinics need to be open because of what we do with the students. And mm. so how are we going to create a place that works for older adults? I do have a new step. Don't get me wrong. I, love, <laughs> I like the new step very much uh, yes. as an option for some people. But, yes. um, you know, trying to be able to take all of the expertise we have at our sports ortho clinic mm. um, and use, I mean, to me, that was uh, definitely a different perspective on than some of the orthopedic training I had had previously. So to be able to address low adult, older adults with low back pain, yeah. um, really from a much better evidence-based perspective than even I had done in, in my earlier career. So I think we really took the best of the orthopedics and then um, have worked over time to be able to really build up our, our population who has neurologic impairments mm. and make sure they're still receiving the best dose-based therapy. In fact, um, Darcy Reisman did one of her dose-based um, uh, clinic assessments mm. um, in our clinic to really look at are we appropriately yeah. dosing. And you know, even when we think we're trying really hard, mm-hmm. we're, we were still not necessarily up to speed and what do we need to do about it? Yeah, yeah. Um, uh- I have a question. I've got a a friend that is a listener of this show. I'm not going to name names, but they are uh, planning on on building or opening a, a clinic that does focus uh, primarily on older adults, and it'll be kind of a rehab uh, and a fitness hybrid. Uh huh. Um, perfect. What, what would you say to them in terms of uh, just things to consider, or what they should do or should not do in terms of kind of creating this space from scratch? Well, you know, if you're going to be – the nice part about outpatient is typically yeah, people are fairly community mobile, mm-hmm. you know. So you're, you're going to have a um, – at least initially a fairly mobile older adult population. But recognize that once word gets out that you know what you're doing, mm-hmm. um, then the older adults will find you uh, who are perhaps less mobile and, and need more care. And so really making sure you have adequate space but that you have appropriate – levels of equipment for them. Mm. Um, just because it's an older adult clinic doesn't mean you don't need decent resistance equipment. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. And, but also space to do functional activities. Uh, you know, is there a decent space where you can do a six minute walk test mm. in your clinic? 
um, mapped out. And one of the things we did, so we, we moved into our new space two years ago um, and we built into it an intention of uh, here is our track for the six minute walk test. Wow. Um, and, and with that, we could put a harness system um, around the track. So, okay, we can do the track just by itself or we could do it with somebody in a harness if that's what we need to do. Uh, and really trying to look at covering that gamut of if I put someone in a harness, can I t- test their balance more hmm. um, and push them harder? That's kind yeah. of one of our things we're looking at a little bit now to take away that fear of falling mm. component. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, how do you design your clinic? You make it look like a clinic that's welcoming for mm. older adults. <laughs> you know, yeah. some uh, we we do different volume, um, yeah. perhaps as far as music in the room um, than than our sports and orthopedic side. Or you know, how do you manage the 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 large volume if there's a lot of people in there at the time so that yeah. people can hear the instructions? Yeah, um, all of those kinds of pieces that that go along with working with older adults. But it has to be a friendly, welcoming place. Mm. Uh, for people to really um, want to come in. Yeah, that sounds awesome. The The track uh, makes me think of your colleague, uh, Cole Galloway. Yes, he and, helped design it. <laughs> <all right. laughs> That's awesome. Um, th- this kind of goes along with, you know, we're talking about that clinic and, and just, you know, the, your work in that. Um, I saw that you presented at CSM in 2015, the exercise prescription for the older adult with multiple chronic conditions. Mm-hmm. Um, what... What were some of the big, what for you, what are the big takeaways from that talk? I, you know, I wasn't there. I, I didn't get to see the slide deck or anything, but I was just curious to hear your perspective. Some of the big uh, pearls of wisdom from, from that presentation. Uh, yeah. If you boiled it down, uh, exercise is good. Really? <laughs> really. I know wow. it's shocking. <laughs> um, but like we could, we could make it a 10 hour presentation if we wanted to go over all the studies that show how, yeah. you know, how beneficial exercise and physical activity is for this population mm-hmm. or different, you know, different chronic comorbidities. But there are so many pieces of literature now that say how, how important it is. Our, our question is always dose and timing and how much and what yeah. type and, uh, you know, Typically, more is better to a certain point mm-hmm. without overdoing it. But the older adult has just as much ability to um, gain strength by appropriately dosed resistance training yeah. um, as a younger person does. And so don't, because because they have these comorbidities, assume that they're frail. Mm. There may be a frailty comorbidity kind of issue. Yeah. but. And it doesn't mean that you can't still use the appropriate dosing techniques. And so, you know, there are 60 to 80 percent of a one or 10 rep max might only be a couple pounds. Yeah. But if you don't establish that with good data, then you may not be giving them any resistance at all. Preach it. Um, and and function's important. You know, if uh, I, I love strength training, those kinds of pieces. But at the same time, I may only get my older adult to do five exercises like that may be all I can get them to commit to. And I need to make them be the most bang for their buck that I can get. Yeah. And so how do I make it, if it's a functional activity that they'll enjoy doing more or more realistic, how can I approach dose that as well? Yeah. And in your mind, how would you define functional? Like sit to stand, um, you know, probably the, you know, we, I think there was, I can't even recall the exact data, but you know, how many times does somebody stand up during the day. Yeah. Um, and if they're not getting up and moving around, then that's so many lost opportunities. And so how do we get them to be able to, even if it's, you know, resist them enough. So stand, doing a sit to stand, I love one of the pictures of, you know, with a 20 pound dumbbell, mm. you know, even doing a sit to stand with that weighted vest or with a weight in your hands is better than doing nothing. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I just asked that question because for me, functional used to mean doing something on a BOSU ball or, oh, no, <laughs> or unstable be. surfaces and, and just how clouded that term can be. But definitely since, uh, you know, working with older adults in the home health setting, uh, functional has taken on a whole new term for, yeah, for me. Exactly. Well. It might just be practicing getting up from the floor. Yeah. Uh, you know, and that takes a lot of muscle strength and power and use at the right time to be able to get up and down. De- on a bunch of times. Yeah, definitely. So, so you mentioned the clinic that the students are working in and that, I mean, that in and of itself is an amazing opportunity. Um, but what other ways 
are older adults taught in the curriculum or students exposed to older adults at the curriculum there at Delaware? So, you know, like a lot of programs, we have, uh, you know, a course dedicated to it. Some people do like integrated lifespan concepts and, and we have a, a, a three credit geriatrics class that I mm-hmm. teach um, at the, it's one of the last classes they have before they go out on their full-time internships. And so, you know, one of the things I was able to, to do is, you know, bring in the, um, the document that the uh, geriatrics Academy of Geriatric PT had created to really look at entry level education and what should be included from a mm-hmm. geriatric perspective. Um, and so I, I was fortunate to be able to work on the group that did that. And then awesome. as I worked on it, I could change my class um, <laughs> to make sure I covered everything that we really wanted to cover. <laughs> and so now if we moved our class to that now it's at the end of the curriculum and we really look at it from an integration perspective. So it's not a lot of, um, there's some data that you can't avoid one of the changes that happen to somebody as they age in the musculoskeletal system and cardiopulmonary system. But to really be able to take it and, and go, okay, so now you have this case. And, and I actually have my students follow a, a case across the semester. Mm-hmm. Um, and then you have this person, now that you've learned this, what do you need to do? And they have to blog post about what they would, um, now that they have this new information on aging, how does that impact how the treatment plan for this patient would go? Wow. We talked sensory changes. Okay, now you're doing a home health visit and you smell food spoiling in the fridge. What are you going to do? And what does that mean? And why is that happening? Mm-hmm. So that they can link pedagogically what they're learning about aging and balance and falls and, and different issues that can occur to a case that I'm hoping and it seemed to work so far that mm-hmm. they can then take out with them because then I, I just find it sticks better. Wow. They're blogging. That's so cool. They're blogging, yeah. <laughs> So I, we talked earlier about, you know, some of your students uh, listen to this podcast, which blows my mind because I just thought my mother was was listening. But <laughs> uh, so there's there's obviously some students that are interested in older adults. Um, is are they still uh, the minority you feel like of the typical PT student? You know, I do. I, I it's, um we attract certainly, you know, a large population of people who are interested in sports and orthopedics mm-hmm. and, um, you know, a growing number of people with neurology. And, you know, and I think anything in neurology and rehab is going to get you older adults yeah. kind of yeah. piece as well. The, what's been really helpful for me as far as, I guess, maybe just um, supporting my self-confidence with doing it is just seeing that no matter what area they go into that they feel out come out feeling like they're competent in working mm. with older adults because i you know if you want to work in orthopedics that's lovely i'm i'm all for that and appreciative of people who do that cuz that's not what i really want to do yeah um but when you do it you're probably going to have a population of people over the age of 65 coming into your clinic yeah no matter what unless you're working in peds and then they have grandparents that are going to have issues that you need to be aware of so trying to be able to produce clinicians that even if it's not what they go into full time, um, they can at least recognize it and appropriately treat the population um, mm-hmm. when they're out in the clinic. Yeah, that's a good point. So let, let's say, you know, you are completely in charge of a doctor to physical therapy program. And, you know, this is an ideal world. You don't have a lot of hoops and tape to jump through. What would you add to the curriculum that, that is not available right now? I, I think there's a growing interest in it and uh, wellness would certainly be one of the areas because okay. I, I look at where our profession is headed and um, I th- think we have this huge untapped opportunity to be leaders in the health and wellness, particularly for people with chronic disease. Mm-hmm. The... Um, there's a lot of people who can help do exercise and that's wonderful for, you know, I consider a fairly healthy population. Yeah. But this group that needs a supervised physical activity with some specific recommendations and recognition of um, medical issues that may be changing and need to be monitored, mm. uh, you know, I think that's probably one of the, the big pieces in, in entry-level education that even – I know I certainly didn't get it many decades ago when I was in school, but yeah. even now I think we're touching on, but it's, um, you know, it's small parts mm-hmm. of most of the curriculum, but I think how to successfully implement it. You know, one of the things I wish 
you know, I love how our program does with their integrated experiences in our clinics here yeah. because it, it really gives us an opportunity to know the curriculum, know what they've had in the curriculum before they get into the clinic, yeah. um, that, that close integration. And I think more people are trying to do it in different ways, which I think is wonderful. And so every minute that we can have them with a real human person who has needs contact, whether through service learning or clinical integration or those kinds of pieces, I think change the student to be a better, mm-hmm. better clinician eventually. Yeah. Yeah. And the, you know, you mentioned the wellness piece. There's two people that uh, you should look up if you, if you're not familiar with them already and listeners as well. Um, so they may be familiar with them. Christina Novak is one. Mm-hmm. Uh, she has a website called staveoff.ca and she's up in Canada and she she is a CrossFit athlete and a coach uh, but she is scaling you know these workouts appropriately to an older adult population. So um, I know CrossFit can have a lot of baggage with with a lot of people but uh, she's doing some amazing work. And then Mike Eisenhart, you you may be familiar with him. Yeah, I know. I know of Mike mostly. Okay, yeah. So he has a website called freetheyoke.com which mm-hmm. is freeing yeah, the the yoke, the burden of of chronic diseases and yeah, I'm I can really get behind what he's doing, but I definitely see kind of what what they're doing but then how our uh just really uh specialized knowledge of working with this older population of what they can handle, what they can't handle and how to do it, uh, you know, safely and effectively. I think we're, we are in a good spot. So that's a good point. I like it. So you, you also mentioned that you have created a geriatric residency. How, how was that to create a residency from, from scratch? From scratch. <laughs> you know, Yes, it was um, quite a bit of work. We um, we were the second geriatric residency that was credentialed here um, wow. in the country, and so fortunately, Greg Hartley, who had the first one, was you know a, a good friend and, and was able to give me some direction. Yeah, where is he? He was uh, at a St. Catherine Villa in Florida. Okay. Now at, I believe at an academic program. Okay, um, but. He, Really, the university here, we had a sports and orthopedic, sports and orthopedic residencies already. So there was structure and certainly massive support Mm. uh, to get this up and running. And and it was really one of the other pieces, starting the clinic and starting the residency program that I came on to do. So we started and and went through and it was really looking at the description of specialty practice and what areas do we um, can we provide in-house we're an outpatient clinic. Our university is not associated with an academic medical center. Mm. And so we, you know, we could provide clinical care and mentored clinical care here as well as some didactic. Um, but really the rest of geriatrics had to be done outside. Mm. And so um, where were we going to send our students that they had our residents to appropriately see all the rest of geriatric physical therapy? Um, so it was, you know, developing some um, relationships with an academic center with a skilled nursing facility and assisted living facilities, but to, and adult daycare, Mm. um, some, all of those ranges of facilities so that they can home health to, um, go out with a therapist. And what's unique about delivering care in this model? Um, I can teach them all about the geriatric principles, but okay, now apply it in a home where you, you know, you can only bring in what you've got. Mm. Um, now apply it in rehab when you have someone who's at this, um, level right after an injury. So um, that was the the kicker for us was really trying to do it. And then how do we want to have them spend time with physicians? What What is the benefit of spending time with a geriatrician and with a geriatric pharmacologist? Hmm. Um, and so finding the right supplemental people to provide things that are influencing physical therapy and what we can learn from them. And then what do you need to communicate with them when you send them information about your patients? Um, so that was a really great partnership for us to get in with an orthopedist. Okay, so when you do orthopedic rounds, what do they need to know about your patient so that you can write more effective um, letters to your doctors or have more effective phone call conversations? Hmm. What would you say to someone that has been out of school for five to six years that wants to be a better clinician? Is a res- is residency a wise thing to do? Yes, I think you know residency is – an opportunity to get um, guaranteed mentoring. Part of the residency requirements is, you know, a certain number of hours per week yeah. um, of clinical mentoring, which 
you know, sometimes people are promised and, and jobs and don't always find. And so, you know, trying to um, take your skills and really amp them up. It's been an interesting of how many clinicians have come through all of the residencies that I've seen here, how many are experienced, how many more versus more new grads. And, and everybody learns to be better yeah. from where they are. Sometimes, you know, sometimes it's changing bad habits. <laughs> there was that have been out for a while. Um, and other times it's in introducing new, new stuff. And so um, I think it's a great opportunity. It, it, obviously, it's not the only way um, to, to be a better therapist. And, and, you know, I fully support finding what works for you mm-hmm. financially and, um, you know, in your career and family life to keep that, that good balance. Yeah. But it is a, it is a compressed um, time frame of really intense training. Yeah. How long is, is your all's residency? Ours is 13 months. 13 months. Nice. Awesome. Yeah, I've, I've thought about that in, in the GCS as well. Um, I'm kind of at that point where I feel like I need uh, some structure to my learning and, mm-hmm. and some accountability as well. Yeah, and, and even just prepping because back when I prepped for the GCS, there were no residency programs. They mm-hmm. didn't exist. And so, you know, I taking – prepping for, taking, and then the res- things that changed from my life from having the GCS were so incredible. Um, and so much more than I ever thought they could be. I doesn't just do it. It is so worth it. Yeah. All right. You're very convincing. Oh, good. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm happy, you know, I'm happy to mentor. If you need some, some thoughts, you're certainly welcome to call me. You're going to regret that. <laughs> All right. Let's shift gears a little bit. I'm, I'm going to ask uh, just kind of some quick questions of uh, your responses. Definitely don't have to be quick at all. Um, what would you tell your 25 year old self? Oh, um, be more confident. <laughs> really? Yeah. You know, uh, you're doing the right things. Things are going to come along. Um, I, you know, at, at 25, I was, uh, had just moved into owning my own business at that point with my <laughs> husband. It's kind of hard to imagine now. Um, but you know, stick it out. It's, it, you know, there is, uh, so many great opportunities coming your way and just keep doing what you're doing. Well. Wow. That is crazy to think about uh, you all jumping into that because, I mean, I think about that in this day and age when all the knowledge is there and how to do that. You know, Mm -hmm. I mean, it's just, you know, click away. Um, But you all, you know, didn't necessarily have that luxury. You you actually had to talk to people, which is weird. (laughs) Or, you know, maybe go somewhere, look up documents and and just, you know, a lot more uh, research involved. And it was probably very unknown jumping into it. So that's that's pretty cool that that you did that. I admire that for sure. Thank you. Um, What's been your most helpful continuing education uh, throughout the years in terms of working with older adults? Wow. Um, You know, so um, some of the pharmacology pieces, uh, I'll put a plug in for uh, Dr. Chuck Saccone. Um, His pharma. Chuck Saccone? Yes. uh, He's was out of Ithaca, which is where I w- did my um, my PT school. Okay. But his uh, stuff on pharmacology is engaging and interesting and so important uh, to really understand in daily clinical practice what we're dealing with. Yeah. Um, I, I attended several of uh, my good friend, Dr. Carol Lewis's courses um, back early in my career and at other times to, to really just see she was one of the first people kind of looking at integrating some of the research mm-hmm. um, on strength training. Uh, back in the 90s. Um, and then, you know, I, I've i been going to uh, APTA and Geriatrics Academy now, uh, the sections um, course of work at CSM and, and at annual conference for years. Yeah. And, you know, the nice part with that is picking what's the right level mm-hmm. um, and from a variety of topics. So really trying to um, touch into go to orthopedics for this track because that's not, you know, this might not be something I'm as completely familiar with. Or, you know, at this point, am I w- with dementia? What's new in dementia? I can get a pretty quick yeah. um, look at the what's going on by people who who seem to know pretty much what they're doing with that. Yeah, yeah, that is that is a good opportunity. What about um, your the certification you got, the exercise expert for aging adults? Mm-hmm. Um, has that been helpful? Immensely. So, you know, I... I was on the board for the Geriatrics Academy when we 
started implementing this and, and doing the research and putting it together and the core group that worked on creating a curriculum uh, that evolved into the CEAA. And there is so much in- information out there that mm-hmm. uh, I think experienced clinicians didn't have when we were getting trained. Mm-hmm. And so um, you know, a lot of, some of it is stuff that I teach in my class, you know, so I think our students today are getting exposed to it differently, perhaps than, than those of us who've been out yeah. even five years. So the, what we, you know, what you do in the three weekends is one weekend's all on test and measures. One weekend is all on just exercise principles um, and then doing them in a fitness center and going and trying all of the equipment and making sure you know how to use it correctly and use good form. Mm. And then the next weekend is all on um, addressing the exercise prescription to the different comorbidities and nice. different diagnoses. And so uh, where I see is a lot of experienced clinicians who haven't either needed to use CEUs because they're state or hadn't necessarily kept up on things and really um, being that to me is one of the kickers about I really feel like when we come out of there, we've changed practice Yeah, yeah. Um, that people can go back to have things that are very clinically applicable mm-hmm. um, and will be providing better care after each weekend that they've been there. That's awesome. That's awesome. And I'll, I'll go ahead and plug uh, XPAC as well. Mike Putoff was, was on the podcast before. Yes. Um, are you going to that this summer? I actually, yes, I'm, I'm doing one of the pre-cons and oh, um, speaking on uh, uh, musculoskeletal changes in aging. Oh man. I, after talking with him, I was very upset that I'm not going to be able to make it. And you're, you're increasing the the FOMO as, as some would <laughs> call it right now. Um, but yeah, XPAC, E-X-P-A-A-C, to the f- a few people, you listeners, Google that, and that'll come up as well. And I'll put all the links to the courses, the C E E A A X pack, all that stuff in the show Wonderful. notes as well. Um, so let's let's dive into the last question. It's my favorite question of all. So let's say you know we're at CSM. You have every geriatric rehab clinician in the room, as well as students. What would you tell them? I would say just be proud to work with older adults. You know, I think sometimes we we think of ourselves as like the lesser, mm. you know, area. It's uh, I've often said it's not quite as sexy. Yeah. You know, certainly working with athletes, but we're the people that are going to keep these patients living healthy um, lives, living hopefully on their own or at least as functional as they possibly can be for as long as they can be. And you know, you want to talk about meeting APTA's vision mm. of transforming society. This is a segment of society that people don't have a lot of expectations of, perhaps. Mm. And I think even if we can just change the expectation that aging can be a great thing, mm. uh, you know, and being functional and uh, most of our older adults are fairly happy with their lives, yeah. that it's not a bad thing. And so everything we can do to keep their quality of life as strong as possible uh, is transforming society. I love it. I love it. Well, thank you for your time this morning. Um, Kathy Cholick from the University of Delaware. Um, if people had questions for you or wanted to pick your brain, um, is there a preferred way to get a hold of you? Whether, you know, it's email is all email. Okay. Yeah. Email's fast. It's my last name, C I O L E K at U D E L dot E D U. Okay. And I'll, I'll link that into the show notes as well. So yeah, just thanks for your time and and just your work uh, in academia and just influencing students and and getting them exposed to, you know, the beautiful world of geriatrics early on instead of uh, in a roundabout uh, indirect way, like, like I did for sure. So I'm sure your work is appreciated and uh, tell your students, thanks for listening to the podcast. That was very, very humbling as well. Very good. (laughs) (laughs) All right. All right. Thank you. Hit me. Thank you for listening to the Senior Rehab Podcast. The show notes for this episode and much, much more can be found at SeniorRehabProject.com. If you found value in this conversation, please share this with one other person that could benefit. And until next time, do not forget to stay funky.